Today I'm looking at a compact, inexpensive, audiophile grade power amplifier. Did I say audiophile grade? Well, this is how Fozzy Audio describes their V3 from audiophiles and for audiophiles. Seeing as how I've never described myself as an audiophile, I'm in a bit of a quandary whether I'm qualified to review it. But I'll review it nonetheless, from my own point of view as a sound engineer, sometime hi fi enthusiast, and just an ordinary person maybe in need of an amp. Fuzzy Audio, by the way, sent me this amp. There's no other payment or sponsorship involved. And if there's a promo code in the description, which there might be if I have one, and if it's valid time and date wise, I don't get anything from that. So I have the amp and I can say what I like. The first thing I'll say is that this amp is tiny. 16.5 by 10.4 by 3.6 centimeters, or 6.5 by 4 by 1.5 in American units. One reason it's so tiny is that the power supply is external. And of course, being a power amp, it needs a powerful power supply. The one I have is as big as the amp, pretty much. But I'm sure you'll store it somewhere it can't be seen, so it doesn't matter. So I had to comment on that, the compact size of this amp, before commenting on the power output. According to the marketing materials, this amp can achieve 300 watts per channel into 4 ohms. That's 600 watts. That's a hell of a lot of watts, so how can a tiny amp like this manage it? Well, firstly, it's Class D. What's Class D? Well, a traditional power amp would be Class AB. This means that there's a small standing current in the output stage when the signal is zero or at a very low level. Then the current is ramped up for the positive and negative excursions of the waveform. Class A maintains the whole of the current for the whole of the time, diverting it to the output when necessary, which is inefficient, but audiophiles seem to like it. Pure Class B would have too much distortion for audio. Class C isn't used for audio, so we can forget about that. Coming to Class D. This is hard to explain without long-winded rambling, but if I say Class D audio amplifiers work by rapidly switching transistors on and off, to convert the audio signal into a pulse width modulated signal, which is then filtered to produce the amplified audio output. Hopefully, you'll get the gist. Now, whether audio files would approve of Class D is a good question, which I may venture into in a future video. As with digital audio, chopping up the waveform and then reconstituting it like packet soup is often frowned upon. But hey, if we can get a good frequency response, low distortion and low noise, surely nothing else matters. And what we certainly can say about Class D is that it's very efficient, converting 80 to 90% or more of the volts and amps coming out of your main socket into actual audio. Of course, there's more detail to these classes, but I think this is enough for now. So, we have a compact, efficient amplifier capable of producing 600 watts over the two channels. Surely, and considering that it's advertised as being suitable for audiophiles, the Fozzy V3 is going to be expensive. Well, think again. I've just been on the Fozzy Audio website, and the price with a 48 volt power supply is $109.99 USD, with an offer, presumably time limited, of $105.99. I'm guessing that the GBP prices will be higher, but that's usually the way. You can cut the cost a little to $89.99 USD by choosing a 32 volt power supply. The power output will be less, but I'd just get the 48 volt power supply. I mean, why not? So, a 600 watt power amp for around $100. There must be a catch, mustn't there? Well, kind of, and kind of not. Here's a question. How should you measure the power output This is, unfortunately, a question with multiple answers, and there doesn't seem to be much agreement on which answer is correct. OK, let's consider the amp producing a sine wave into a load. Fuzzy quotes for 4 ohms. My three sets of speakers are 8 ohms, 8 ohms and 7 ohms, so I'd get less power. But let's go with 4. Let's suppose that you give the amp a sine wave and ramp up the volume control until the output is 34.64 volts from the peak of the peak to the trough of the trough. Stay with me. 
Power is equal to voltage squared divided by the resistance of the load. So that's 34.64 squared, which is 1200 very nearly. Divide that by 4 and we get 300 watts. For two channels, that's 600 watts. Q-E-D. Quad erat demonstrandum, if you'll pardon my Latin. If you're a manufacturer of power amplifiers, you'll be very pleased if you're getting figures like this. It sounds like a lot of watts. And you will see many amplifiers specified, or shall I say marketed, to have an amazing number of watts. But the method of measurement isn't specified, and I have to wonder whether it might be peak to peak. I might not be an electronics expert, I'm just a dabbler. One electronics module in my degree. But let's explore this further. The oomph in the power output of an amplifier, it's not a technical term, but I'm sure you know what I mean. The oomph comes from the area under the curve. You could quite easily, in concept, flip the negative part of the waveform and measure from zero to the peak. Clearly, this is going to give us half the voltage than before. So we can measure peak to peak or just peak. Peak will be half peak to peak. So how many watts do we get now? Going back to 34.64 peak to peak, peak is half of this, which is 17.32. Squaring this gives 300. Divide by 4 ohms and we have 75 watts. 150 over the two channels. As you know, 150 is not 600. But there's more. My old physics teacher used to describe the proper way of measuring power as how much heat do you get? Actual heat that you could measure if you had a big enough calorimeter. For a sine wave, we need to divide voltage again by the square root of 2. So that's 17.32 divided by 1.414, which gives us 12.25 volts. Going to my trusty calculator. Squaring that gives us 150, and we divide it by 4, which gives me 37.5 watts, and across the two channels times 2 is 75 watts. It's a long way down from 600. This is the root mean square, or RMS, measurement. So, I probed further. Not as far as I would like to have probed, perhaps, but limited by the equipment I have around me. I was able to get the Fozzy V3 up to 60 volts peak to peak using an 8 ohm dummy load and measuring on my oscilloscope. What stopped me going higher was how much input signal level I had available, but anyway, this is 56 watts RMS. So there's certainly, almost certainly, more in the tank and more into a 4 ohm load. But why take the word of a dabbler? Why not consult an audio expert? So I did. I went to audiosciencereview.com, where there are lots of lovely charts demonstrating various technical stuff around the Fozzy V3. The one that shows power output gets to just over 100 watts before distortion kicks in. There's no specific reference to RMS, and although the caption states, both channels driven, it doesn't clarify whether this is 100 watts from one channel or both channels combined. I'm guessing one channel. I'm going to leave this topic soon, but I have to say that it has, as you might realise, has been bugging me. But one more thing, the 48 volt power supply. On the back, it's rated at 5 amps. Power equals volts times amps equals 240 watts. So if the power supply supplies 240 watts, the RMS rating of the Fozzy V3 can't possibly be more than 120 watts per channel. This ties in quite nicely with Audio Science Review's figure, so I think this is where we are. It's enough for a lot of purposes. I also note that Fozzy has a table of power outputs according to power supply. Down at the bottom there's a mention of a 48 volt 10 amp power supply which by simple multiplication can give us 480 watts. The table gives the output into 4 ohms per channel at 280 watts, which would be 560 watts combined, which is more than the rating of the power supply. I have to say that this could be more clear. The headline figure of 300 watts per channel could be misleading. It depends on whether your speakers are 4 ohms, 8 ohms, or whatever, and it also depends very much on the power supply. Now let's get into other matters. What fantastic features does this amp have? Hardly any, and that's how it should be with a power amplifier. Two line inputs, two loudspeaker outputs, and a volume control. That's all it needs, plus an LED to show that it's on. 
Some would say that if you're driving a power amp from a preamp or an audio interface, then the volume control isn't necessary. But in this case, it's a convenience feature and I don't mind it. Looking online, there seems to be a fuss about an optional orange volume knob at extra cost. Well, I'm sure audiophiles will want it. I have it, so perhaps I should explore what extra resolving power it brings. The on-off switch is combined into the volume control. Some people might have preferred to set the volume and leave it. Combining the switch, of course, is why wax pencils were invented. Around the back is a pre-out mini jack. This also has been an issue on the internet. What might you want to use the pre-out for? Well, connection to an additional amp for a subwoofer might be a good use for it. Unfortunately, the signal from this comes from before the volume control, so it isn't as useful for that as it could be. Anyway, though, I'm sure there are other uses it can be put to. You don't have to use it. I probably wouldn't normally do this, but Fozzie's literature makes it very tempting to look inside the V3. And here it is. It looks as neat as it should. But I'd like to concentrate on what's really interesting. The powerhouse behind the power of the V3 is the Texas Instruments TPA3255 chip. So you could get yourself one of these and a datasheet and build a V3 yourself. Then you would be a true audiophile. No, perhaps not. I'm sure that Fozzie has tweaked the design with several layers of perfection. Also considering the important issue of heat dissipation, despite the excellent efficiency of class D. One interesting thing I spot in the datasheet is a chart of distortion against power output. And just like audiosciencereview.com, I see distortion kick in just above 100 watts, whether into 4 ohms or 8 ohms. Sadly, there's no mention of RMS. In fact, there's no mention of RMS anywhere in the datasheet. What's happening to the world? I suspect, though, that RMS it is. It would conform with the rating of the 48 volt 5 amp power supply. The other thing I note inside the V3 is the op amp, operational amplifier. An op amp is a handy chip for amplification at lower voltages. There are many designs of op amp, including the infamous Fairchild 741 and its imitators. That's the one where in the 1970s there was the debate between modernizers and those who preferred discrete transistors. Discrete was a buzzword of the time. Well, the 401 was bad. Noisy and a good way to demonstrate slew-induced distortion. But a miracle on its introduction in 1968, so credit where it's due. But then came the Signetics 5534, which I've noticed in Mr Neve's mixing console circuit diagrams. And the two-channel version, the 5532. You'll find differently branded versions now. So inside the V3, we have two 5532 twin op amps handling the low voltage workload. So what? So what? So what? Well, here we find ourselves in true audiophile territory. Tube rolling. That's where audiophiles will swap the vacuum tubes in their equipment to try and achieve a better sound, a more highly resolving sound. And audio professionals can do that with tube microphones too. Certainly with microphones, it's a real thing, and it really can make a difference. Not necessarily better, just different textures. It wouldn't surprise me if people do it with transistors, too. <laughs> so when you're the proud owner of a fuzzy audio V3, you can roll the 5532s for 741s and enjoy realistic 1970s sounds. Or you can treat yourself to higher performing op amps and perhaps get better sound. Although the 5532 is pretty good already, so good luck with that. There are even such things as op amps made from discrete components. I know that because in my era of electronics enthusiasm, I designed and built some myself. It was a long time ago, and I'm not going back. Come on, a hundred quid, or dollars, or so, for a cute amplifier like this. What's not to like? But let's be sensible here and figure out what the Fuzzy Audio V3 could be used for. For myself, I see the V3 as a handy utility amp to have around. There's always a time when you need an amplifier to be just handy. And if one isn't, well, you'll wish that one was. I have to consider, though, that the Fuzzy V3 could be an ideal replacement for driving my Yamaha NS10M Studio near-field monitors. 
It has the power and it has the specs. It would replace my Quad 306 when I eventually hear audible signs of it ageing. It could also drive my second hi-fi setup. I say hi-fi, but I use it as a second, smaller home cinema setup. It will be driving my vintage Sonab OA5 speakers, which every audiophile needs to hear at least once in their life. Each speaker has four tweeters on the top that reflect from a central post, throwing sound around the room. <laughs> I first heard them in a hi-fi shop in around 1974, playing Edgar Winter's Frankenstein. They were on my shopping list from that point. Now, the big question would be, can the V3 drive my B&W 801s in my living room home cinema setup? Well, I'm going to try all three of my setups and hear for myself. I'll go and do that and I'll be back later to report. OK, I've done that. Whoever designed skinny binding posts with tiny holes through them should have been fast-tracked to a more appropriate career. Great big binding posts with great big holes for big fat cables. That's what we need. Or banana plugs in places where they're not illegal. I'm a practical person and I don't count myself as an audiophile. What I'm looking for is good frequency response, low noise and low distortion. I'll add to that no signs of stress, control over the loudspeaker drive units, the woofers, and when I'm watching my favourite art house films, like Fast and Furious, <laughs> I want crashes and explosions to be loud and clean. So, my Sonabs. Well, despite their interesting spatial qualities, they're really not the best sounding speakers in the world. Maybe it's because they've aged, but they please me in a small way. Yes, the Fozzy V3 is perfectly up to this job. I'd have difficulty thinking of a better solution. By the way, no switch on thump. Power amps should never have a switch on thump, so this should just be ordinary, but it's worth mentioning. What about my near-field studio monitors? Well, they're an easy drive for a power amplifier. I don't need them to be loud. What I do need is that every detail that I put into my music or my video soundtracks, I want to hear. That's why I have the Yamahas. Again, with good frequency response, low noise and low distortion, the Fozzy wins again. I know how hi-fi reviewers use flowery language that the amp really opens up the soundstage. <laughs> Try that again. Really opens up the soundstage and enhances resolution as though a veil were lifted. Well, all of that. The Fozzy is at least as good as my Quad 306. I can't hear a difference. But now for the big test. Can the Fozzy Audio V3 drive my B&W 801s? I can't put my hands on the manual for my particular 801s, but the manual for a similar version states that the required amplifier power is 50 watts to 600 watts. I'd say that 50 is rather on the low side. But I don't have that big of a room to fill, and I'm always in the best seat in the house. Again, with the Fozzy, I'm not aware of any inadequacy. And this, I feel, is where I would hear it. Seeing as I already know from our listening experiences that the frequency response, distortion and noise are fine, I'd have to be listening for audio issues in very high levels, as in explosions, crashes, etc. in action movies. Also, I'd have to be listening whether the Fozzy can control the 12-inch woofers properly. So, I re-watched A Fast and Furious on Blu-ray, some Netflix, I played a variety of music with clearly articulated bass and percussion, classical from the BBC proms. I couldn't find anything not to like here. One non-issue for me is that to get my B&Ws up to speed, by which I mean loud enough, I have to turn the knob nearly all the way. All the way is too loud, but with any less sensitive speakers there may not be enough gain here. It isn't a power output issue, just a gain issue. It probably won't affect you. Other than that non-issue for me, the only point I perhaps have <laughs> is that the V3 just looks too damn small for the job. I mean, who am I going to impress? I know I should have a more powerful lamp for my BMWs than I do already. The Fozzy would work, but for speakers that would have cost me three and a half grand if I bought them new, seven grand adjusted for inflation, an amp costing a little more than a hundred quid doesn't seem quite right. I understand completely the flaws in this argument, but sometimes you just want what you want. 
OK, that's it. The Fozzy Audio V3 is a cute little amp with a low price and good performance. Unless Fozzy sends me a return label to send it back, I think I'll keep it around as a handy utility amp for a while. Then, when my quad dies, it can drive my near-field monitors. See you soon. Wait! <laughs> I've looked at a few of the reviews of the Fozzy Audio V3, partly to make sure I haven't missed anything I want to cover, and partly to make sure my review is sufficiently different to be useful, not just yet more noise. But one thing I've noticed is how some reviewers point out that the volume control potentiometer is logarithmic rather than linear. And they seem to be amazed by that. Come on, this is one of the first things you learn either in electronics or audio. Linear pots are great for loads of things, but they're not so good for volume because all of the control bunches down at one end. A logarithmic pot works the same way as our ears do, so the change in volume is smooth. In audio, logarithmic volume controls are normal. Everyone knows that. I've heard he has a pair of Sonob OA5 loudspeakers. Yes, they each have four tweeters firing upwards to spread sound all over. I'd love to hear them. Where does he keep them? They're in his bedroom. You know, I've never liked Sonob speakers. Me neither. I never want to hear them again.